everybody and welcome to satisfactory ASMR life <laughs> I'm Vanessa and today there's a little bit of background noise because it's Saturday and people want to party <laughs> also today I will be reading scary excerpts from Stephen King's It. I know you might be thinking this book is a little bit too mature for me, but I'm an advanced reader for my age, so I've been reading a lot of advanced books. Like, I just finished The Hunger Games two days ago. I liked it. And I started reading this in February last year. But then I lost it after getting up to page 200. And then found it again. Got up to page 500. And I thought I should read to you some of the quotes. Not quotes. Too long to be quotes. Some of the excerpts that make it as scary as it is. Characters so real you will feel you're reading about yourself. Scenes to be read in a well-lit room only. <laughs> Lucky us. A great book. A landmark in American literature. The Moby Dick of horror novels. So, let's start reading. The first one is from, is a part of the iconic first scene in the newer movie. In case you haven't read the book yet. Everything down here floats. Oh, sorry, it's when um, Georgie is interacting with Pennywise. Everything down here floats. A chuckling, rotten voice whispered, and suddenly there was a ripping noise and a flaring sheet of agony, and George Denver knew no more. Dave Gardner was the first to get there. Although he arrived only 45 seconds after the first scream, George Denver was already dead. Gardner grabbed him by the back of his slicker, pulled him into the street, and began to scream himself as George's dead body turned over in his hands. Graphic. Reader beware. The left side of George Slicker was now bright red. Blood flowed into the storm drain from the tattered hole where the left arm had been. A knob of bone, horribly bright, peeked through the torn cloth. The boy's eyes stared up into the white sky, and as Dave staggered away, towards the others already running pell-mell down the street, they began to fill up with rain. Now, <laughs> very graphic, very scary book. Ooh. I think I'll explain this one after I'm done reading it. The bathroom was lit by fluorescent tubes. It was bright. There were no shadows. You could see everything, whether you wanted to or not. The water in the tub was bright pink. Stanley lay with his back propped against the rear of the tub. 
Kate's head had rolled so far back on his neck that strands of his short black hair brushed the skin between his shoulder blades. If his staring eyes had still been capable of seeing, she would have looked upside down to see him. His mouth hung open like a sprung door. His expression was one of abysmal, frozen horror. A packet of Gillette Platinum Plus razor blades lay on the rim of the tub. He had slit his inner forearms, open from wrist to the crook of the elbow, then crossed each of these teeth just below the bracelets of fortune, making a pair of bloody capital T's. The gashes glared red-purple in the harsh white light. She thought the exposed tendons and ligaments looked like cuts of cheap beef. A fat drop of water gathered at the lip of the shiny chromium faucet. Grew big, grew pregnant, you might say. Sparkled, it dropped length. He had dipped his right forefinger in his own blood and had written a single word on the blue tiles above the tub, written it in two huge, staggering letters. A zigzagging, bloody finger mark fell away from the second letter of this word as his finger had made that mark she saw as his hand fell into the tub where it now floated. She thought Stanley must have made that mark his final impression on the world as he lost consciousness it seemed to cry out to her. Another drop fell into the tub. Plink. That did it. Patty Uris at last found her voice, staring into her husband's dead and sparkling eyes. She began to scream. This is scary. This is the Georgie's picture book scene. And here, it wasn't the end of the book, but it was the last page that mattered because the following ones were all blank. The final picture of it was George's school picture, taken in October of last year, less than 10 days before he died. In it, George was wearing a crew neck t-shirt, crew neck shirt. His flyaway hair was slicked down with water. He was grinning, revealing two empty slots in which new teeth would never grow. Unless they keep on growing after you die, Belle thought, and shuddered. He looked at the picture fixedly for some time and was about to close the book. But what happened in December happened again. George's eyes rolled up in the picture. They turned up to meet Belle's own. George's artificial say cheese smile turned into a horrid leer. His right eye dropped, drooped, closed in a wink. See you soon, Bill, in my closet. Maybe tonight. Bill threw the book across the room. He clapped his hands over the ma- over his mouth. The book struck the wall and fell to the floor open. The pages turned, although there was no draft. The book opened itself to that awful picture again. The picture which said school friends 1957 to 1958 beneath it. Blood began to flow from the picture. Bill sat frozen, his tongue a swelling, choking lump in his mouth, his skin crawling, his hair lifting. He wanted to scream, but the tiny whimpering sounds crawling out of his throat seemed to be the best he could manage. The blood flowed across the page and began to drip onto the floor. Bill fled the room, slammed the door behind him. (laughs) 
I'm sorry, there's an ice cream truck. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, that's terrifying. Your late brother's picture book. Winking at you. I can't even imagine. No. Now, on to the next excerpt. A series of diagonal cuts slashed across Bill's fingers at the point where they ceased being his fingers and became photo fingers. It was as if he stuck his hand into the blades of a fan instead to a picture. Richie seized his forearm and gave a tremendous yank. They both fell over. George's album hit the floor and snapped itself shut with a dry clap. Bill took his fingers in his mouth. Tears of pain stood in his eyes. Richie could see blood running down his palm to his wrist in thin streams. Let me see, he said. It hurts, Bill said. He held his hand out to Richie, palm down. There were ladder-like slash cuts running up his index, second, and third fingers. The pinky head barely touched the surface of the photograph, if it had a surface, and although that finger had not been cut, Bill told Richie later that the nail had been neatly clipped, as if with a pair of manicurist scissors. Jesus, Bill, Richie said. Band-aids, that was all he could think of. God, they had been lucky. If he hadn't pulled Bill's arm when he did, his fingers might have been amputated instead of just badly cut. We, we gotta fix those up. Your mother can... N never mind my mother, Bill said. He grabbed the photo album again, spilling drops of blood on the floor. Don't open that again, Richie cried, grabbing frantically at Bill's shoulder. Jesus Christ, Bill, you almost lost your fingers. Bill shook him off. He flipped through the pages, and there was a grim determination on his face that scared Richie more than anything else. Bill's eyes looked almost mad. His wounded fingers printed George's album with new blood. It didn't look like ketchup yet, but when it had time to dry, it would. Of course it would. And here was the downtown scene again. The Model T stood in the middle of the intersection. The other cars were frozen in places where they had been before. The man walking towards the intersection held the brim of his fedora. His coat once more bailed out in mid-flap. Two boys were gone. There were no boys in the picture anywhere. But look, Richie whispered and pointed. He was careful to keep the tip of his finger well away from the picture. An arc showed just over the low concrete wall at the edge of the canal, the top of something round, something like a balloon. <laughs> no, no goosebumps yet. I spoke too soon. <laughs> oh, Pennywise. And here's a little, 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 little line. It was the clown. It was the clown pretending to be Georgie. That's right. Richie said. It, like it was the clown pretending to be the mummy when Ben saw it. Like it was the clown pretending to be that sick bum Eddie saw. The le le leper, right? But is it really a clown? It's a monster, Richie said flatly. Some kind of monster. Some kind of monster right here in Derry. And it's killing kids. Oof. Okay. Now. This is also another Bill and Richie scene. The last scene was of Bill and Richie looking at the yearbook that Bill had seen that little excerpt before and them experiencing it and seeing both of themselves in a picture that they had never been in. So, now another. 
Mayor Bill and Richie seen. There was Silver, still leaning against the tree. Bill jumped onto the seat and threw his father's pistol into the carrier basket where they'd carry so many play guns. Richie changed a glance behind him as he flung himself onto the package carrier and saw the werewolf crossing the lawn toward them, less than 20 feet away now, blood and slobber mixed on its high school jacket. White bone gleamed through its belt about the right temple. There were white smudges of sneezing powder on the sides of its nose, and Richie saw two other things which seemed to complete the horror. There was no zipper on the thing's jacket. Instead, there were big, fluffy orange buttons, like pom-poms. The other thing was worse. It was the other thing that made him feel as if he might faint or just give up and let him kill him. Let it kill him. A name was stitched on the jacket in gold thread, the kind of things you could get then at Matchins for a buck if you wanted it. Stitched on the bloody left breast of the werewolf's jacket, stained but readable, were the words Richie Tozier. And that's it. For that excerpt, we have two more to go. Ah, my God, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, no, I would not make it through that. That is horrifying. I. <laughs> okay. I think I'm kind of giving you all the kind of popular ish horror scenes in the movie it except that last excerpt was not in the new movie i don't think now on to the next one something clicked inside the tape measuring's housing and it be suddenly began to run rapidly back into its case the numbers and hash marks blurring by near the end the last five or six feet the yellow became a dark dripping red and she screamed and dropped it on the floor as if the tape had suddenly turned into a live snake. Fresh blood trickled over the clean white porcelain of the basin and back down into the drain's wide eye. She bent, sobbing now, her fear of freezing weight in her stomach, and picked the tape up. She tweezed it in between her thumb and the first finger of her right hand and holding it in front of her took it into the kitchen. As she walked, blood dripped from the tape onto the faded linoleum of the hall in the kitchen. <sighs> she steadied herself by thinking what her father would say to her, what he would do to her, if he felt that she had gotten his measuring tape all bloody. Of course, he wouldn't be able to see the blood, but it helped to think that. That is the scene of, I don't, yeah, it doesn't say her name. This is Beverly. Beverly was, um, putting the tape down the drain after the balloon had popped out, filled with blood all over the bathroom. This is when she's putting the tape down the drain to see what's happening, and when she pulls it out, you see the blood, and, ugh. And this is the last excerpt, so you, you don't have much horror right now. This is more of a suspenseful, not very scary. And then I saw that I had company in the night as I slept. The tracks, trying to faint muddy impressions, led from the front door of the library, which I locked. I always locked it to the desk where I slept. There were no tracks leading away. Whatever it was, it came to me in the night, left its talisman, and then simply disappeared. Tied to my reading lamp was a single balloon filled with helium. It floated in the morning sunray, which slanted in through one of the high windows. It was a picture of my face, the eyes gone, blood running down from the ragged socket. Scream disorting the mouth on the balloon's thin and bulging rubber skin. I looked at it and I screamed. 
a scream echoed through the library, echoing back, vibrating from the circular iron staircase leading to the stacks, and the balloon burst with a bang. That was of Mike, and I am done. I am officially done with this horror novels excerpts. Like I said, I'm only halfway through, and there are probably so many more excerpts that I haven't seen, that I haven't read yet. So, for now, I ha I am done. If you want to see another video like this, comment down below. <laughs> and comment from 1 to 10 how much you like scary movies. For me, I'd give it a decent 6. So, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. And hit that notification bell to stay updated. Bye!